the question is what do we want from the future? What quality of life do we want for ourselves and for future generations? And whether we can actually attend to our behaviours and change them. It may be too difficult to do, but that would be pretty disappointing. How do we provide energy, keep a clean environment, allow people all over the world to come up to the scale of prosperity and health, provide them with food, clothing, shelter, and clean water? How can we have our cake and eat it too, if you will? How to accomplish the good things and minimize the bad? It is the system that keeps us you know, digging bigger holes and putting more trash in them and putting it into the ocean. And if we think about what we actually do and the amount of products you use every day and the things you throw away, it's quite extraordinary. Making a transition to a more sustainable planet is the ultimate challenge for all of us today. We want to tackle really important societal problems and of course, that does require pulling together basic science, engineering, and users. The challenge for me tries to address the issue of societal wealth, how to maintain it into the future, in particular how so-called developing world can increase their standard of living and yet do it in a sustainable way. I see real possibilities for developing countries to make new contributions. Not only do they have the opportunity to start from scratch, but they're also not locked into old knowledge. As the world's second largest economy, China is becoming an increasingly important innovation center, focusing on an R&D collaboration and early stage innovation development. Maintaining the engineering and physical sciences capability to respond to future challenges and opportunities does not happen by accident. Many of the global challenges we face require cross-disciplinary teams using flexible funding. The method is not to pick winners, it's to reduce barriers and maximize the chance of any technology getting traction. Working with China on innovation is key as it explores the potential to build a pool of technology collaborations to break down barriers to collaboration and innovation. From working with scientists and engineers, I've learned we're all creative people. I think that's really where we break down the barrier of the supposed two cultures. I'm very hopeful that this summit will find some common themes and perhaps uh, suggest best practice or suggest experiments, almost like a startup company. Grand Challenges implies that it can be solved from the top down, and I reckon a lot of it will probably solve from the bottom up. It's always the unexpected that comes out of a new technology. It's never the way that we imagined it would be, and that's also where great innovation comes from. Nobody understands this more intuitively than children who have been brought up in the age of information technology. They don't quite understand what impossible means. They don't have the scars people like me have, so they're unencumbered. They know that they are connected to others like them all around the world, and that their future is a future that is shared by everybody. This brings both dawning challenge and, I think, great hope. Well, good morning. As uh, chair of the steering group, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this first Global Grand Challenges Summit. Uh, in addition to those present here, the whole summit is being filmed, including the question and answer sessions, and streamed live to a global audience joining us online. I'd also like to welcome them, and also to those participating in satellite events staged by the IET. And these are taking part in Birmingham and in multiple sites across India. 
For the local participants, I've been asked to include some housekeeping uh, notes. Um, Savoy Place, the building we're in, is non-smoking, uh, and that includes the balcony area outside the Riverside Room. In the event of a fire alarm, and I've been told there are no practices scheduled today, so if we hear continuous ringing of the bells, it's the real thing, and we're asked to evacuate through the nearest, well signposted uh, uh, fire exits, and everyone is to assemble uh, underneath Waterloo Bridge, where we'll receive further instructions. Um, and finally, as I'm sure you found out, the cloakroom is in the basement, and there are toilets on every floor. For nearly a year, I've led an international steering group planning the agenda for this event. And the germ for all this was the 2008 NAE, um, uh, US NAE uh, National Academy of Engineering report, Engineering Challenges for the 21st Century. In this project, the NAE identified 14 grand challenges that would drive the engineering research agenda into the 21st century. This exercise really caught the imagination of the engineering community in the US, and the NAE Grand Challenges have been used to excite high school pupils about engineering, and then National Grand Challenge Summits began in the US on US uh, cap university campuses. And although they were originally intended to enthuse undergraduate students, the very powerful message emerging from these events that there was a desperate need for integrated engineering systems approaches to meeting grand challenges that really caught the interest and imagination of a broader, more senior audience. But grand challenges are inherently global and solutions need to span countries as well as disciplines. Quite simply, the problems facing the global community are too complex and urgent for any one country, group or methodology to tackle alone. And that's why I was so pleased to be asked to chair this first Global Grand Challenges Summit in which the NAE, the Royal Academy of Engineering and the Chinese Academy of Engineering have come together to explore collaborative approaches to tackling global grand challenges. In preparing this summit, we had some discussion about the relevance of the 14 grand challenges set by the NAE in 2008 to the, tw to the world in uh, 2013. Should the point of the London summit be to introduce a 15th grand challenge or to come up with a new set of challenges. And in the end, we decided that just missed the point. The 14 NAE Grand Challenges were not intended to be the last word on our engineering priorities in this century and shouldn't be read as such. Instead, they should be seen as a call to action to demonstrate that an engineering-led approach can define any global challenge and create a pathway to a solution. That engineering know-how can be the focus of creativity and of the wider networks required to make a difference and overcome these challenges. I'd like to thank my fellow steering group members for the work they've put into planning this event. Tom Katsoulis, Yanis Sortos, Rick Miller, Tony Hay and Wu Jiangping have all been great to work with. We drew up our dream list of speakers, and wow, here they are. I mean, we're going to hear from an impressive cast of international figures. But this summit is much more than uh, just the invited speakers, distinguished as they are. It's about the interactions between the mix of people taking part. We have very senior policy, industry, research and education leaders coming together with the leaders of tomorrow, uh, promising students, researchers and emerging industry stars. 
we very deliberately have allocated lots of time for questions and discussion. And it's this dialogue across disciplines and sectors, as well as across generations, that we hope will lead to a wealth of fresh ideas and hence practical solutions. Because this summit is not about listing or analysing big challenges, but rather about developing solutions, real solutions based on innovative ideas that address grand challenges holistically and don't just move the problem elsewhere. Solutions that are aspirational but grounded in pragmatism. Put simply, the aim of the summit is to formulate action plans to take forward. I believe that while engineering has a very special role to play, effective responses to these grand challenges will be inherently interdisciplinary, collaborative and international. I'd like to end by thanking our sponsors, Lockheed Martin, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, and the Institution of Engineering and Technology, and also Microsoft, who sponsored the Grand Challenges Summit Day held yesterday. I'm really grateful to the Academy's staff, whose hard work has made this event happen. And as the host academy, the Royal Academy of Engineering has borne much of this load. And Shane McHugh, Holly Wright and Eleanor Wood in particular have done a really fantastic job. And I'd like to express my very special thanks uh, to them. I'd now like to invite Sir John Parker, the president of the Royal Academy of Engineering, to make a short address. Sir John. Well, my lords, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as president of the Royal Academy of Engineering, it is my very great pleasure to welcome you all to London to this first Global Grand Challenges Summit. Over the next two days, you will hear from some of the most eminent engineers in the world. Famous names who are in the headlines and some unfamiliar names behind the headlines. Cutting-edge researchers and leading-edge innovators. Senior figures with great achievements and up-and-coming engineers with great ideas. Makers, doers, designers, thinkers and leaders. We have one thing in common, a conviction that we can all benefit if the engineering profession becomes better engaged with the challenges the world faces today. We are now far enough into the 21st century to see that unlocking complexity will be critical for us to respond effectively to these challenges. We're still recovering from the global financial crash which had a failure to grasp complexity at its heart. We're in transition from an economy built on cheap, abundant energy and natural resources to one where rising populations and rising prosperity are multiplying challenges of scarcity and access. We are reliant for much of our communication, transport, energy and security on a digital and physical infrastructure which was not designed to support current levels of traffic and where interdependencies have created unanticipated vulnerabilities. These are indeed grand challenges. But there is nothing more that an engineer likes than a challenge. And looking at the talent in this room, and as I go around the world and meet engineers, 
I cannot help but feel optimistic. This summit is rooted in the belief that it is time for engineers to show leadership and that if we do, we can not only address these challenges, but make things better than they have ever been before. It was the British Prime Minister, Disraeli, who coined the phrase, change is constant. Yet all too often, we fail to embrace, embrace the full meaning of that expression. As the UK's National Academy of Engineering, we are spending a lot of time working to ensure that the UK, and in particular our engineering community, is well positioned to respond to global change. But alongside the axis of global competition is an equally important axis of global cooperation. Our systems, ourselves, and our nations are interconnected as never before. The global nature of our economies, supply chains, research endeavours, communities, as well as the environmental impact of our activities, means that our futures are inextricably linked. We simply cannot afford not to collaborate. But perhaps the most compelling reason to collaborate is that none of us is as smart as all of us. This is a great time to be an engineer. Our academy recently showed that in the UK at least there's a real national and personal benefit in pursuing an engineering career. We're currently running an engineering for growth campaign calling attention to the massive contribution engineering makes to the economy. In fact, it accounts for something close on 30% of UK, UK GDP. We're about to launch an enterprise hub to provide our most promising entrepreneurs with practical support from our 1,500 fellows from across industry and engineering academia. And next week, we will announce the first winner of the £1 million Queen Elizabeth Prize for engineering, a truly global undertaking that will reward the best engineers of this generation and inspire the next. In thinking about the future, we can take inspiration from the achievements of the great engineering leaders here today and from centuries past. By being idealistic, they dared the public and politicians to think of technological development the way the Victorians did, not as an ordeal we undergo, but as a process that we drive. By being far-sighted, they united people behind their vision, and being bold, they put engineering leadership where it belongs, at the centre of society. Let's pick up that baton. Before I close, I would like to add my thanks to that of uh, Dame Anne Dowling, to the United States National Academy of Engineering for inviting us to host this first Grand Challenge Summit, and particularly Chuck Vest, who led so much of this work, but sadly, he can't be here today, but we're shortly to hear from his successor. Then the Chinese Academy of Engineering for working alongside us in this collaboration and agreeing to host the next summit in 2015. <clears throat> Our event partners, Lockheed Martin, plus the Engineering and Physical Science Research Council and the Institution of Engineers, Engineering and Technology, without whose support this event could not have taken place. Microsoft for supporting yesterday's Grand Challenge Student Day and the companies and engineering schools who sponsored the attendance of their most promising young engineers. And then to say a special word of thanks 
to Professor Dayman Darling and her fellow steering group members. And we knew that in Anne and her team at the helm, we were in safe hands. In finishing, I'd like to quote from a famous proverb which I'm rather fond of. The opportunity of a lifetime must be seized during the lifetime of the opportunity. And I hope as engineers we will seize this opportunity to explore how we can respond to the global grand challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Sir John. I'd now like to invite Professor Dan Moat, Officer and President nominee of the US National Academy of Engineering, uh, to make a short address. Um, President Sir John Parker, uh, Honorary Chairman Song Jian, Dame Ann Dowling, Distinguished speakers, grand challenge student contestants, national delegations, ladies and gentlemen. The US National Academy of Engineering is a most enthusiastic sponsor of this first Global Grand Challenges Summit. We thank the Royal Academy of Engineering for organizing the summit and for its splendid hospitality for all delegations and attendees. Even more importantly, we thank the Royal Academy of Engineering for leading the first partnership of our three national academies into the domain of global grand challenges. The Grand Challenges is an initiative of the U.S. National Science Foundation that was initiated and put into place during the NAE presidency of William A. Wolf. Subsequently, the current NAE president, Charles M. Vest, has champ championed it enthusiastically where its reach into educational programs, competitions, national symposia, and visions of the future has expanded greatly. In fact, it has legs for the students who really are going to solve these problems. While each of our academy missions pronounces our responsibilities to our countries, this summit recognizes that addressing great global challenges is indeed a responsibility of our respective countries. Engineering provides the most pragmatic and possibly only first steps to address great global challenges. To paraphrase Taoism founder Lao Tzu from 26 centuries ago, do the difficult things while they are easy and do the great things while they are small. A journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. I look forward to the light cast on the single steps by the summit's remarkable speakers. Based on the great uh, interest in this summit among US participants, its timing is greatly appreciated and highly anticipated. I thank the sponsors, including the generosity of Lockheed Martin Corporation, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, and the Institution of Engineering and Technology for your support. Without it, this summit could not be reached. I also thank IBM and Genentech for their backing of the US Grand Challenges video competitions, and of Microsoft for its support of the UK student competitions as well, that would have not been possible uh, without their supports. I look forward already to the next global summits planned for Beijing in two years and for the U.S. in two years thereafter as continuing recognitions of our global missions together and of engineering's role in the world. A half century ago, as a young engineer, uh, engineering graduate, I recognized that my work in engineering would be somewhere in my country except possibly for temporary excursions elsewhere. Today, young engineering graduates recognize that their work in engineering will be somewhere in this world, except for possible temporary excursions elsewhere. <laughs> it is fitting, actually, that our academies are adopting a similar appreciation of our changing global responsibilities and work together. I extend my uh, heartiest best wishes for all for a most successful first Global Grand Challenges Summit. Thank you very much, Professor Mote. Uh, I'd now like to invite Dr. Song Jiang, 
honorary chairman of the governing board of the Chinese Academy of Engineering uh, to make a short address. Our respected president in the elect, uh, Dr. John, uh, Dr. Dan Moles. <laughs> uh, we from Chinese Academy of Engineering, a small delegation, are uh, invited by uh, Sir John Parker to join this first summit. We are very feel honorable and privileged to join the triangle initiatives for this event in the future. And we are ready to continue uh, this event uh, two years later. Uh, we welcome everybody to join us two years later in Beijing. Uh, I just want to inform you uh, how China's science and engineering communities responded to this UN, the Global Grand Challenge Summit. Uh, we, I mean the scientists and engineers, very much appreciate the initiative made by uh, U.S. National Academy uh, of Engineering Sciences. And the host uh, for this time, the first summit held in London, uh, we are all invited by uh, Sir John Parker uh, to be present today. Uh, I mean, uh, all engineering communities of China uh, very much appreciate the initiatives, the aim and the end, the goal of this event we consider is very important for this today's world. Uh, and please, high hopes on this event, and we wish to join hand with all our colleagues in US, in Britain, uh, in UK, uh, to work together to share our common vision, common goal with our friends and colleagues of the world over. Uh, to share the vision and work together to implement, realize our vision. Uh, I want to, uh, very short, to tell you how the Chinese engineering community feels about this subject. Uh, as we see almost all today, all developing countries people when China is one of them, I uh, feel the most reliable, available, and experienced uh, sector in science is engineering uh, for sustainable development, for battle of the disaster, whether it natural or man-made to improve the living of people, alleviate poverty, and so forth, uh, protection of the, the environment. All we can, we can rely on and absorb, get some knowledge, experience from uh, from this sector of science. So it, it, it is extremely 
extremely important for the European countries to keep the path what our uh, predecessor have gone so successfully. The second, uh, it is the common goal, common vision, even in, as we, as I see personally, in developing countries, uh, as just uh, our president said very eloquently, uh, China, we have a, a, a problem. Uh, anything wrong can open at any time. Disasters, uh, earthquake, tsunami, tornado uh, can happen every time it brings great loss of lives and wealth for population. So uh, humankind should be ready, prepared to, to struggle with the, their own, our own survival and development. Uh, because recently China, Japan, and uh, India, uh, 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 Southeast Asia, uh, we ex experience great losses from earthquake, tsunami, and so forth. Th this kind of things of uh, of things could happen any time. So we say, moon waxes, wins. Uh, so we have to prepare. And the engineering science is the only one, the only important, reliable, and available for everybody, for all nations to battle against uh, the disasters to prevent losses. So we really hope uh, this idea, this vision, could be continued generation by generation. Any generation will not be able to quit or ignore engineering science. We should, uh, I hope we, uh, all the document speakers, uh, uh, thesis and ideas could be spread over the world to invite all young generations, our colleagues, to share our common vision and solve, face, brief the new grand challenge of our generations. Thank you very much. I would now like, oh, thank you very much, Dr. Song. I'd now like to introduce the moderator for this summit, Professor Jim Akalili. Jim is Professor of Physics at the University of Surrey. He is also an author and broadcaster who regularly prevents TV science documentaries. And he's the presenter of a weekly Radio 4 program the Life Scientific. Um, Jim, I'm now going to hand over to you. Thank you very much, Anne. Well, distinguished guests, distinguished speakers, ladies and